Closing arguments in the James Holmes trial began on, well, begin on Tuesday. The defense wrapping with two silent surveillance videos showing Holmes in police custody. Now, in one video, he's seen naked in a jail cell, then running his head into a wall. A second video showing a restless and restrained Holmes in a hospital bed. The defense trying to prove he was legally insane at the time of the 2012 movie theater shooting. But have they done enough to save their client's life? Let's bring in Mercedes Cohen, Fox News legal analyst, and Robert Schalk, defense attorney. Thank you both for, for joining us right now. This is a very important case, and many of us remember what that day was like. And do you think the defense has done an adequate job in proving that he was insane? Well, you say adequate job. Have they done their job? Yes. They've raised a legitimate defense where there's an individual with a history of mental psychosis and mental issues. The question is, is it enough? Uh, in most criminal defense cases where you're raising insanity, they're successful less than 2% of the time. And most times you're trying to create that insanity defense more or less on the spot. This guy has a history. So the defense did have a lot of things to work with. Do I think they did enough? Probably not. But again, they did their job the right way. Mercedes, history or not, in terms of mental illness, right. this guy committed a heinous act. Horrible. Horrific. It affected so many people in that community. And many people are simply saying, call it what it is. It's evil. It has nothing to do with mental illness in this case. And therefore, some people are saying he's faking it to make it. Kelly, that is such a great point because it's so hard for these jurors. You killed executed 12 people and then shot another 70 and oh by the way when they did those video recordings by the psychiatrist those 22 hours that the jurors actually got to see he talks about I saw the terror in their eyes does that sound like someone is insane I saw as they were running away I'm reloading I'm gonna go shoot them what are you doing playing target practice with these people this is not a video game this is serious and the fact that he had that type of consciousness during that heinous act means he wasn't insane at the time of that of that murder of all those murders and, and so how does this case move on? How do you see it? I know you, I, you don't want to predict what's going to take place, right. but, but what can we in the public learn from these kinds of cases, particularly this one? Well, in this one, I think you, he's not your typical defendant. He's very educated, very smart. He was a doctoral student at the time. And as Mercedes so appropriately pointed out, you have an individual who created a manifesto, and it's going to cut both ways during these, right. these, these, these closing arguments. He had a notebook uh, that was 27 pages, and the title was Insights into the Mind of Madness, where the defense and the prosecution are going to be able to use this notebook to their advantage during summation. And let's go back to his mother right. uh, after in the, in, the, in the waking hours after everyone woke up to this tragedy. Let's go back to the fact that his mother kind of sensed that something was amiss and that he had given some telltale signs that something might take place. Now, I, I can't reinvent the real, I'm not in the courthouse, right. I'm not an attorney. But the point is, there were signs out there that this guy might have been pulling the trigger at some point in his, in his oh, future. Oh, undoubtedly. There were definitely signs, but there were two psychiatrists that came forward and said, uh, and the judge appointed psychiatrists, not the defense, right. not the prosecution. The judge asked two psychiatrists. What they said is, yes, he has a mental illness, but he was legally sane right. at the time of the murders. So that's a, that's a big distinction. And, and I, got, I mean, unfortunately, there are people with mental illness. Not all these individuals that are mentally ill are going to commit these heinous crimes or any sort of crime. But this is an individual that may have had that history, but frankly, at the time that he executed those individuals, he was perfectly fine, perfectly sane, and should be held accountable. Right, I agree with that, because if you look at the manner in which he carried out the crime, mm -hmm. you have an individual who wore tactical gear, mm -hmm. parked his car at the exit, booby-trapped his apartment. All of those things indicate an individual that was calculated, methodical, and cold-blooded. He Which, laid out a plan. He laid out a plan, and, and he carried it out, and it was all in the notebook that the, all the jurors have, it was read to them, they all got copies of it, and that, again, is going to be, I think, the one thing that convicts him uh, if, they, if they come back with a guilty verdict. How, how do you, <laughs> both of your attorneys, how do you prepare for a case like this in the first place when you see the, the atrocity that was committed? You know, for, for us or as defense right. attorneys, you really just have to say everyone has their due process. And their cases, and I'm sure Robert feels the same way, we, we can't handle those cases. This is something I, I know that the Constitution exists. I know everyone should have a fair trial. But this type of case just does, I can't defend a person of that magnitude. And it, it happens. You decline right. those cases. But frankly, a lot of defense attorneys will tell you it's about the Constitution. It is and about the, right the Constitution. Absolutely, Robert. Yep. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Thank you both for uh, weighing in on that. We'll continue to follow the developments of this and wait to see what takes place next week. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kelly. All right, Molly.
A terrifying scene as two teens become stranded on a raging river. That and just how they were brought to safety next.